So, Father, we bring you this new series that you have given to us and pray that from your word we might discover new things. Uh, the wonderful psalms that you have given to us which teach us so much. Lord, teach us something new today and throughout the coming weeks of this series. Lord, hear the prayer of your people and the church together said, Amen. Amen. And so we begin this new series uh, for the next four weeks, Worship in Psalms. So you know what books we're going to be looking at in the next few weeks, right in the centre of our Bibles. And uh, let's turn to Psalm 95 this morning, which is page 602, I hope, in at least the majority of Bibles scattered around uh, this room. Once you found the place, keep your finger in it, and I'm just going to read directly from it right now. But again, as last week, have it open on your laps in a moment, and we'll go through it. But before we do that, let's just hold it in our hands and say, I hold God's word in my hands. It encourages, corrects, and instructs me. Lord, speak to me now. Psalm 95 there, keep it open. For our 80th anniversary, there's one here if you want to show. You got one, okay. For our 80th anniversary we had in June, we sent out how many invites? 119. 119. No, 19. 19. 19 invites. Um, and obviously that was more people than, than the invites because they were fans and so on. And um, it was quite interesting as Catholics had been forced to going through all the list of names and thinking who we could invite and so on. Um, and invites can be great. Receiving an invite can be um, fun. And uh, I found a couple of invites um, that I want to put up on the screen this morning. You can see them. Um, this is an invite, obviously, it says, uh, will attend, unable to attend. Please initial your uh, entree choice. Chicken, vegetable lasagna, steak, child. No children will be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear about that. Um, the favour of a reply is kindly requested by May 5th. Uh, enthusiastically attend, regretfully decline, regretfully attend, enthusiastically decline. <laughs> I'd like to know how people tick those boxes. <coughs> So, um, what is the best invitation that you received? Talking about invitations, anyone got any um, wonderful invitation? Back in the palace, tea party, or anything like that? We've all got the invitation going to go to the Lord. We have all got an invitation. Ah, oh, it's, it's very spiritual, that, isn't it? We've all got an invitation going to go to the Lord, yes. No better than that. There's none better than that, no. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Done. 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 Okay. End of. Anyone? Want to mention any invites? I'm not pressurising you. We just had a lovely granddaughter's wedding. Indeed, you did. And you had an invite to that, I'm sure. We did. <laughs> and you replied. <laughs> and you went. <laughs> good, good. Um, so this is the first in the series, and I've called it, he says, clicking over, an invitation to worship, an invitation to worship, and uh, that's what I think uh, Psalm 95 is about. So let's read the first couple of verses, and uh, then we'll take a look at those and then move on um, a section at a time. 
So verse 1 and 2. Come, invitation. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. So verse 1 and 2 are very much invitational. Come. It's an invitation to do what? Well, in verse 1 it says, Come, let us sing, sing for joy to the Lord. Uh, it's about inviting those who are reading this psalm or saying this psalm to come and sing for joy. No real surprise that singing is involved in worship. And then it says in the second line of verse 1, let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Shouting, shouting in church, shouting in worship. Really? Uh, well, this expression is used, of course, several times in the Bible. Uh, the obvious one that came to my mind, maybe not particularly a worship session, but uh, in the name of the Lord, there was a lot of shouting going on in Joshua 6 and verse 20 when the Israelites were marching around the walls of Jericho and ready to take it in the name of the Lord. Uh, we read, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. But also uh, in 1 Samuel 4 and verse 5, where we read about what happened when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the camp. All Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. That must have been a pretty loud shout. I guess most those two must have been pretty loud shouts. Uh, the Old Testament worship is always seen as uh, exuberant and vibrant. Um, singing, shouting, you know, clap your hands, sound horns, shake timbrels. Um, are we like that? Maybe a little bit more conservative. Very reserved. <laughs> reserved, yes. Um, can we be like that? Could we be like that? Yes, we could. And uh, there's never anyone stopping anyone from being uh, that exuberant in worship. So, to this celebration, we can bring a guest in our invite. And the guest is called Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, of course, is very important in worship. A thankful heart creates in us that desire to worship the one who has given us so much. And when we stop and take in what God has done, and we are thankful to him, uh, thanksgiving really then gives uh, a response uh, of worship for what he has done for us. So thanksgiving is important in worship and uh, it's why we often start off a morning service thinking about thanking God and praising him. We're kind of reversing a little bit this morning um, for the reason of our theme but uh, and I've said in times of prayer, in our own times of prayer at home and so on, that it's good to spend a great deal of that time of thanking God, worshipping him uh, for who he is and what he means to us. And then we get the word there, extol. Extol. Um, praise enthusiastically. You know, when you extol someone. Oh, they're amazing, they're wonderful, they've got this great job and so on. And when we're talking about God, let's extol him. He is an amazing, wonderful God. Use all the different words that you like um, that uh, just lift him up and declare who he is. And uh, that's good to do. How enthusiastic are we in our praise? How much do we extol the Lord? Or do we sing and praise him on a kind of a level down here when he is worthy of everything that we have and everything that we are? Um, it mentions music and song. Important in worship. 
uh, I would sure struggle being in a, in a Quaker meeting. Um, because I understand there's a need for quiet. We've talked about the need for quiet. Uh, even silence at times when we are uh, talking with God and so on. But worship week after week in silence is really not me. No music, no song. Because the Bible is full of people singing in worship from Psalms uh, to the angels who were singing to Paul in prison who was singing. When we have that joy of the Lord Jesus in our hearts, that overflow, I believe, so often comes in singing and worship and music and that kind of thing. And worship is at least should be at times, in regular times, collective. In three times in verse 1 and 2, we read, let us, us, us. A sense of doing it together. I said last week that the, the first church met together several times a week. And the psalmist here implies that while worship should have a private element to it, of course, he is stating that worship is designed to be congregational, together. So why does the psalmist invite the readers to sing and shout? What's the occasion that he is inviting us to? Well, let's read verses 3, 4, and 5. And it starts off 4. So verse 1, 2, this is what you should do. Sing, shout, praise, play instruments. Uh, why? For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So much of this reason to worship him is, is creation, that kind of that wow factor. This is what God has done with his, his handiwork. There is a sense of the earth and the sun and the moon, that vast part of our creation that we can look out upon. There are the mountains and the lakes and the oceans. You can't go anywhere without seeing God's wonderful creation around us. We have the varied weather. Whether you like it or not, we have the varied weather. Um, but of course that varied weather then provides us particularly with water. You know, we're thinking of Zimbabwe and South Africa that are lacking water. And that village we're helping to provide a pump for in the next month or so, so that a whole village of 3,000 people can get water. And uh, we have it falling out of the sky quite regularly. We have it on our taps quite regularly because it's been collected, harvested, if you like, that water so that we can drink from it and we can wash with it and we can cook with it. Uh, going on from that then, there's vegetation. We know that again, when this borehole is made, they're able then to water some crops. And uh, we have all sorts of lush green vegetation around our green and pleasant land that God has provided, trees and flowers and crops and all in great variety. Amazing. Um, go out and look at some leaves. You might get some funny stares from people, but do it anyway, it's fine. Um, I was even thinking this morning, and now it's been trimmed down a little bit, um, if anyone after the service wants to have a I'm going to say walking around the garden like a teddy bear. Um, <laughs> walk around the prayer garden. Uh, I'll happily go out with you and, uh, and take you around because that prayer garden is uh, underused. It's lovely. It's sunny. Um, and it's got a seat you can sit at. It's got stations you can stop at. So if anyone wants, um, just grab me afterwards and say, can I go out in the prayer garden? And I'll, I'll take you out there and we'll wander around. And uh, if you want to come in the window and uh, just sit out there for half an hour or whatever of 
prayer and suntan and whatever you can do. Uh, it's a great place to be. So just knock on the door and say, can I come in the prayer garden for a while? And uh, around there, you know, again, flowers and plants. You can hear the birds. Lovely. Um, so, the earth, the sun, the moon, the mountains, the lakes, um, the weather, the water, the vegetation, the animals that we have around us, from pets to cattle, from flies to antelope. Just incredible creation that we have around us. And us. You might not always like to get up first thing in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror, but you are amazing. We talked about this before, so I'm not going to spend a great bit of time on it, but just to look at us and see how we move and uh, how we've been designed. It's just amazing. And everyone is different, you know, ear prints and eye prints and tongue prints, and we don't all that. But we are amazing. Been amazingly put together by our Creator, and uh, that is why we should worship. That is why we should praise Him. Uh, that's what it's saying, really, in verses three, four, and five. Uh, verse six and seven. Come again. Invitation. Come. Let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. I said a while back, um, earlier on this year, I think it was, the Bible states quite a number of positions and postures, if you like, to worship our Lord God Almighty. Um, and there's some here as well. Uh, there's the idea of laying prostrate on the floor, there's the idea of kneeling. There's the idea of standing. There's the idea of dancing. Um, I haven't seen yet anyone sitting before the Lord uh, in worship. But here it says, come, bow down, kneel. Why? Because he is our holy God. This is an invitation to a celebration, but not just any old party. It is a royal celebration. And we are to come before him and kneel and bow down. And then there's a kind of a, a change to the picture because it talks about we are the people, the flock. The idea of the shepherd and the sheep. So it's not just a royalty. There is not just someone sitting on a throne and kind of being royal and giving out orders and edicts and so on, but here also is this loving shepherd who is on the throne. And we are his sheep. Sometimes we are lost. And he comes to find us. In the verse 7, today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did uh, at Meribah, as you did that day at Massah in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. <coughs> Let's just trip back again to the beginning of that, the end of verse 7. If only you would hear my voice. Hear my voice. The shepherd again, calling to the wandering sheep. Do you hear God's voice? Do you hear the shepherd? Not just calling you when you wander astray, but when he's around as well. The shepherd kind of talks to his sheep in the field. And God talks to us day in and day out as the shepherd. And I've said before about how we have to tune in to the Lord to hear his voice. Uh, messy church a couple of weeks ago. You can't see them, uh, feel them, touch them. You can't hear them on their own. 
you have to tune in by using something to do that and then you can hear the radio waves and God is all around us and we can't see him, hear him, touch him, smell him and so on in, in that way but we need to stop and we need to tune in to him do you hear God's voice? If you're saying, I don't really hear God's voice, then perhaps you need to stop and tune in, and that can take some time. Maybe go in the prayer garden. Turn off your phone. Don't let anyone know you're there. And tune in to him, or wherever. Get up early in the morning. Say right before I do this, that and the other, I'm going to tune in to what the Lord has to say to me. Not what I've got to say to him, but what he has to say to you. It should never be a one-way relationship where we do what we're talking. But rather we should do some listening as well. Anyway, um, Meribah means quarreling. And uh, Massa means testing. Hurt. Both are the places where Moses drew water from the rock to satisfy the people who were thirsty in the desert. But remember how they moaned and grumbled about God not giving them what they wanted. So the Lord said to Moses, David, hit the rock, and water came out. And these names, these places have become symbolic of a generation who didn't trust, who didn't believe in Yahweh's provision for them. They just kept moaning. We haven't got this, we haven't got that. And so for 40 years, he says, I was angry with that generation. People whose hearts went astray like lost sheep. And the wanderers never found rest. They never entered the promised land that God had indeed promised them. And many people wander. Many Christians wander. Wander from church to church. Moaning at God for not giving them exactly what they want. And wondering why they're never satisfied. As I said last week, Church, Christianity, should never be about what I want. It's not about taking, it's about giving. And so in our Christian life, the Lord was always saying, you should be giving, you should be serving. I'm not expecting to be served. Just a reminder that there's a board at the back, and you took home some sheets last week of areas that you might be able to serve in the church. Um, don't walk on by and walk out. We need to be giving and serving the Lord's work here. Because then we're all a community, serving and helping each other. So, why do you worship? There's a definition that I found of worship in the dictionary. There's probably several different definitions, but all more similar. Which says, worship is a reverent love and devotion given to a deity, given to a God. So again, worship is about what? Giving. Giving. Giving time, giving energy, giving gifts, giving voice, giving a sacrifice, giving in love, giving because you are in awe of the one who is receiving your worship. And you want to do that with other people as well, which I hope is why we're here. Excuse me. <coughs> so Psalm 95 is a call, is an invitation, if you will. An invitation to worship. Come, it says. And yes, we can worship alone. And of course we do worship alone. At least I hope we do. And often. But we can't always do it alone and should not always do it alone. 
Because God is a God of community. He wants people to be together. He wants his people to be like family, like a royal priesthood, like living stones, like a body, functioning together, worshipping together. And worshipping the Lord, God, is enhanced when we do it with other believers. I'm sure you've been here on a Sunday or you've been at another meeting or a prayer time and you've got so much out of the worship because other people have given into it as well and you've, oh, that's really great that so-and-so prayed like that. That's really great that piece of music that was played. It's really great that someone sang like that. It's really great that someone said that in, in the prayer time. <coughs> and it kind of just enhances our worship being together. It's like an orchestra, isn't it? Every instrument is different. Every instrument can be played solo. <clears throat> and most instruments sound fine being played solo. But you put them together in an orchestra. And what a sound. And as God's people coming together to worship. Yeah, we do it alone. It's fine when we play solo. But coming together on a Sunday morning, evening, Tuesday night, whenever, and just <coughs> doing that worship together. What a sound. What a way to glorify God. And Highfield consists of very different people. And I applaud that, that we are all very different people. And as we come together to worship, we celebrate as the psalmist calls us to, to sing to shout, to make music, to give thanksgiving in whatever way his people feel appropriate at that time. And we're going to spend some time now, as I said, at uh, this part of the service, in worship. And we're going to um, do some singing in a moment. We're going to praise together in a moment. And I'm going to play you just a little um, video clip. I hope you've been filling out those cards. And if you haven't, then start it. And again, I'm just going to play a little video clip, quite a short one, uh, just again linking us in with Psalm 95. Come on, the mouse is going to listen. 